Welcome to the second hour of the Rays Aerospace commemoration of the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11. We are approaching T-1 hour and 41 minutes, and after a brief update from the public affairs officer, we will watch an interview with astronauts Neil Armstrong, Michael Collins, and Buzz Aldrin from two days before the launch. After that, I'll provide a brief biography of each of them in turn, but I wanted to give you a chance to get a sense of their characters before I start talking about them. Here now is the Public Affairs Officer, the PAO, with the update. This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control, T minus one hour, 40 minutes, 55 seconds and counting. The countdown is still proceeding very satisfactory at this time as we lead up toward our planned liftoff time of 9.32 a.m. Eastern Daylight. The spacecraft commander, Neil Armstrong, continuing this extensive series of checks with, of the emergency detection system, working with both the launch vehicle test crew and the spacecraft crew. This is a key test and a very thorough test to assure ourselves before we commit to liftoff that all the emergency detection uh, techniques inside the launch vehicle uh, are operating properly here on the ground, so if required in flight, the spacecraft commander and, of course, his two fellow astronauts could be signaled of a difficulty inside the rocket and could take proper abort action as required. Thus far, the three astronauts aboard the spacecraft have just been giving business-like responses back to the uh, directions and checks, working with the spacecraft conductor, Skip Chauvin, as he runs down his procedures as the countdown continues. For T-minus one hour, 39 minutes, 46 seconds and counting. This is launch control. All right, here's the interview, which the PAO will unavoidably interrupt three times with further updates. I have your attention, please. We're now ready to proceed with our news conference. At this time, I'd like to introduce the astronaut crew for the Apollo 11 mission. Lunar module pilot, Edwin Aldrin. Spacecraft Commander Neil Armstrong and Command Module Pilot Michael Collins. We'll now hear from Neil Armstrong. After a decade of planning and hard work, we're willing and ready to attempt to achieve our national goal. This is possible because very many Americans across the nation have dedicated themselves to quality craftsmanship and ingenuity. We're dependent, too, on the successes of the previous flights, the unmanned flights and the manned flights, Apollos 7, 8, 9, and 10, whose crews have done a magnificent job of preparing the way for us. I'm sure this American ingenuity and American craftsmanship has given us the best equipment that can be made available. And we're very happy to be ready to fly. I guess we are, we're ready for your questions. Thank you, Neil. We have a panel here of four newsmen who will ask questions of the astronauts this evening. These four panelists are representative of the more than 3,000 newsmen who are here to cover the Apollo 11 launch at the Kennedy Space Center. The first question we'll have from Mr. Walter Cronkite of CBS News. Well, gentlemen, uh, out there at the Merritt Island, you all look very relaxed, and I assume that you're all quite confident. But I remember, Colonel Aldrin, that at uh, Houston at a news conference last week, you had some concern that the public might be a little overconfident. You suggested that the shouting ought to come after the mission and not before it. Uh, do you feel that the public is putting too much hope on this landing on July 20th? I feel that um, we're seeing about the uh, type of a reaction that, that many of us were hoping for, and that is a, a very enthusiastic public that uh, has great confidence in uh, what our nation stands for and what our uh, space program's aims have been and what we hope to, uh, to carry out in a few days for that American public. 
Do you, uh, do you think, uh, Colonel Aldrin, that perhaps uh, uh, we ought to use if a little more in, in describing the flight, the timeline here, instead of, say, when you land on the moon? Uh, are there still a lot of unknown quantities in this thing? Oh, I don't, I don't believe so, Walter. I think uh, we're quite uh, able to use the term uh, when. Uh, we certainly uh, are thinking positively. We've been thinking positively over the past uh, many years in, in preparing for this flight. And, of course, in the last uh, several months, uh, everything that we've been doing has been very positive uh, in its nature. And, uh, no, I, I think we're quite well uh, suited to... Uh, to say when we land, not if. Next question from Mr. Al Rossiter, Jr. of United Press International. Mr. Armstrong, there has been some concern in the past about Apollo crews becoming too fatigued by intense training in the final weeks before launch. How do you uh, feel at this point in time? Well, it's uh, uh, certainly uh, a... Uh, very hard preparation time and getting ready for flight and uh, and we have been uh, working hard ever since our assignment to this uh, Apollo 11. Uh, however, uh, our pace has, has certainly not been unreasonable and uh, and we think uh, that uh, we're certainly not unduly fatigued and we're ready to fly. Next question from Mr. Everett Clark of Newsweek magazine. I'd like to ask Michael Collins, the forgotten man of Apollo 11, if he can tell us exactly what he thinks, what he expects to be doing up in that command module at the time that uh, Neil Armstrong steps out on the lunar surface. Well, primarily just tending the store, Mr. Clark. Uh, as you may realize, the command module is a very complex vehicle, and uh, just to do nothing inside it requires a, a good deal of switch throwing and a certain amount of attention. So. I expect to uh, be keeping the command module ready for Neil and Buzz's return the next day, and I'll be uh, quite busy doing that. Next question from Mr. Joel Shurkin of Reuters. This is from Mr. Armstrong. There's been speculation about what the first man on the moon will say when he gets there. Will you prepare something ahead of time, or will it be, pre be prepared for you, or can we expect a spontaneous exclamation? Well, certainly nothing has been prepared uh, for me, and our our uh, attention uh, during the training period and up till till now has been focused on uh, how to do the job and how to do it best, and not so much with what might be the emotions of the moment. I think that would be uh, impossible to predict, and uh, so I do not plan. Uh, to, to uh, guess at this point what my uh, emotions might dictate, if anything. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I think perhaps the, the highlight for, for those of us uh, in the limb uh, will probably be a successful touchdown. Uh, I, I really look forward to that uh, the most this time. Mr. Cronkite? Uh, Neil Armstrong, I'd like to explore that a little further. I, I'm sure that old boy uh, will be a, a, an understandable reaction when you put down there, but uh, the world probably is expecting a little something more than that. <laughs> Magazines have done articles about it and a great speculation. You must have had thousands upon thousands of suggestions, and some of them from some pretty high places, haven't you? Well, we certainly have had uh, a large amount of, of mail from uh, the very... Uh, interested uh, public, and uh, it's very, it's a great pleasure for us to uh, find that uh, that the public is uh, so interested in the in the details of the of the uh, program and, and its various facets. Uh, I think this is one that, uh, area that's probably captured uh, the imagination of the of many people that. Uh, are uh, better prepared to, to look at this sort of subject than, than we are, but uh, we really haven't had the, the time or opportunity to give those suggestions the, uh, the attention they're due. 
Haven't the uh, public relations people suggested anything to you, Neil? No, they haven't. <laughs> okay. <laughs> The PAO is about to interrupt the interview with an update, but just as an aside, Neil Armstrong of course ultimately chose to say that's one small step for man, meaning a man, one giant leap for mankind, but reporters didn't believe he hadn't been instructed to say that. So one reporter made a bet with Apollo 12 commander Pete Conrad that he wouldn't be allowed to say, man, that may have been a small one for Neil, but that's a long one for me, when he set foot on the moon. He did, but he wasn't able to collect on the $500 bet. This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control, T-minus, one hour, 30 minutes, 55 seconds, and counting. All elements are go with the countdown at this time, the countdown aimed toward landing two astronauts on the moon. At this time, the spacecraft test conductor, Skip Chauvin, going through some checks with astronaut Mike Collins aboard the spacecraft. We're winding up this important emergency detection system test that Neil Armstrong has been participating in. Meanwhile, at the 320-foot level, the closeout crew now placing the boost protective cover uh, over the hatch now that we have completed the cabin purge and have the proper environment inside the cabin. We have also performed leak checks to assure ourselves uh, that the cabin atmosphere is valid. This boost protective cover is used during the early phases of the powered flight and is jettisoned with the escape tower shortly after second stage ignition. Here in the firing room, the launch vehicle test team still keeping a close eye on the status of the propellants aboard the Saturn V launch vehicle. We're back to 100% supply with the liquid hydrogen fuel in the third stage. This problem with the leaking valve is uh, no problem at this time. We've actually bypassed the valve, but we uh, are maintaining our hydrogen supply aboard the vehicle. Uh, all aspects go. The weather is very satisfactory for launch this morning. A thin cloud cover about 15,000 feet. Temperature at launch time expected to be about 85 degrees. T minus one hour, 29 minutes, 30 seconds and counting. This is Kennedy Launch Control. Mr. Rossiter. Uh, Colonel Aldrin, uh, would you be satisfied if you just achieved a successful landing and takeoff, but uh, for some reason could not step out on the lunar surface and collect the first uh, samples of the moon rock? Well, I, I think it's been uh, fairly clearly stated that, uh, that we're going to feel that uh, we've accomplished a successful mission if we land men on the moon and return them safely. And I believe that uh, is the primary mission uh, as stated. We would like to add as much as we possibly can to this uh, for the return from this flight and also to maximize the uh, benefits that uh, will be able to be obtained from uh, uh, previous or the uh, succeeding flights. We'd like to uh, solve as many of their problems ahead of time and give them as much advice uh, on how to uh, get more return for our uh, lunar flights. Mr. Clark. Well, uh, Colonel Aldrin, following that up, the Russians have Luna 15 on the way to the moon. And uh, there's some speculation anyway that it might be on its way up to scoop up a sample of the moon and bring it back. Uh, you're assuming a, a pretty good flight rather than just a landing and immediate takeoff, uh, and you're hoping to get samples. If the Russians scooped some of this up automatically and brought it back so that they retrieved the first samples of the moon, would, would you feel a disappointment? I'm sure that all of us would. Uh, we'd like to uh, return with everything that we've set out to do on this flight. Uh, I think the, uh, the Russians are to be uh, congratulated on their uh, launching. Uh, of course, I don't have any more information or perhaps a good bit less information than, than many of you people as to what the uh, objectives are of this flight. Uh, they have uh, been rather congratulatory on, on our successes in the past, and uh, I think that, uh, that uh, we feel the same way. We wish them uh, the most success that they can have, and we hope that they uh, have and share the same wishes toward our uh, flights. Uh, Mr. Armstrong, if Luna 15 turned out to be a lunar orbiter, and it was in an orbit that uh, gave us any concern about possible conflict with our orbit, 
Do we have the fuel budget, the extra fuel that we would need to vary our orbit, and uh, or could that would that uh, make you miss your landing site? That's uh, a very difficult question to answer. I think the probabilities are uh, nearly infinitesimal that that would be an actual case. We have. Uh, very many uh, objects in space orbiting the Earth at this time, and yet we don't concern ourselves with not launching into Earth orbit uh, in order to leave for the moon. Mr. Shurkin. So, Mr. Collins, what four events in the flight, in order if you can, do you consider the most dangerous? Well, I don't know. The most dangerous items are those that we've uh, overlooked and not uh, devoted enough attention to in our preparations. And, of course, uh, I have no idea at this time what, if any, they may be. I hope there are none. Mr. Cronkite? I would just pass a note here. As you gentlemen probably know out there at uh, Merritt Island, uh, a large part of the press is, is here in front of our desk, uh, and we represent all of them. And a very noted Italian uh, lady journalist and interviewer, Oriana Falacci, asked a question in direct line with that. Uh, could... Uh, could you describe your emotions as regard that prime human emotion of fear? Uh, do you harbor any fear, or, would, or how would you describe your attitude just before flight? Any one of you, or all. <laughs> well, I, I certainly wouldn't Why don't you say draw straws? <laughs> I wouldn't uh, say, uh, Walter, that fear is an unknown emotion to us. Uh, uh, fear is, uh, is uh, characteristic uh, particularly of, uh, of uh, a knowledge that there may be uh, something uh, that you haven't thought of and feel that you uh, would, might be unable to cope with. Uh, I think our, our, our training in, in all the all the work that goes into the preparation for flight uh, does uh, everything it can toward uh, erasing those kinds of possibilities. And uh, I, I would say that uh, as a crew, uh, we, uh, we, among the three of us, really have uh, no fear of launching out on this expedition. Mr. Rossiter? Along those same lines, uh, Mr. Armstrong, I've heard that uh, your mission has been given by some people an 80% chance of total mission success. Uh, do you agree with that? Uh, are those the rough general figures that you would go come up with? Um, I, don't, I don't have a lot of statistics at hand, but I, I think that's a reasonable estimate. That's in terms of mission success. Uh, that is accomplishing everything we set out to do. Uh, I think that's uh, that's a reasonable estimate. Certainly, our our chance of, uh, of safety is is far greater than that. Mr. Clark, uh, a question for Mr. Collins: If the uh, lunar module gets off the surface and back into an orbit that is lower than 50,000 feet, it seems to me you would probably try to bring the command module down to rescue it. Can you tell us what the absolute minimum is what the lowest altitude to which you could bring the command module is for a, a sort of a rescue of the limb? Well, you're very close to the limit when you say 50,000 feet, uh, given the fact that some mountains are probably in the vicinity of 20 or 30,000 feet high. We would uh, be prepared to go down to the absolute limit, and it would uh, be a decision that would be reached by mission control based on uh, their best d data on what it orbit uh, the limb was in and how low it would be necessary for me to go uh, to effect a successful uh, rescue. And uh, I'm sure I'd be happy to abide by their decision. My guess would be it would be somewhat less than 50,000, but not very much less. Just a few notes while we wait for the public affairs officer again. On another occasion, Neil had estimated the possibility that they would actually set foot on the moon as 50-50, but that was just a gut estimate and he definitely was not going to overrule someone else's considered estimate. On the rescue option, that was only possible if the lunar module made orbit around the moon, but for some reason wasn't able to finish the rendezvous with the command module. 
Ultimately, if the lunar module couldn't reach orbit around the moon again, there was no rescue option. So once Neil and Buzz committed to a landing, they were reliant on the engines on their lander to work. There was nothing Mike Collins could do if the lunar module was not in orbit around the moon. If they ended up in too low an orbit though, or in the wrong orbit, he was all set. He had compiled a 117 page book of all the maneuvers he might need during his solo part of the mission. However unlikely they ended up being necessary. That said, he didn't have time to practice the less likely ones in the simulator. This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control, T minus one hour, 20 minutes, 55 seconds and counting. All still go with the countdown for Apollo 11 at this time. At this point in the countdown, spacecraft commander Neil Armstrong uh, once again appears to be the busiest worker in the spacecraft as he's performing a series of alignment checks associated with the guidance system in the spacecraft. He's working these checks with the spacecraft test conductor as the spacecraft test conductor reads off the various procedures and Armstrong responds to them. The astronauts aboard the spacecraft also were informed by the spacecraft conductor a short while ago that the launch vehicle is go at this time. The hydrogen problem uh, that we did encounter earlier has been solved. That's real good news, said Armstrong, and then he went back to work shortly thereafter. We're now coming up on the one hour, 20 minute mark in the countdown. This is Kennedy Launch Control. Mr. Shurkin? For Mr. Aldrin, is there anything about the lunar module that bothers you? Do you think NASA could have made it sturdier or maybe put springs on the bottom or? Uh, no, there's nothing that I can think of that, uh, that concerns me. We, we would always like to have a little bit more uh, fuel, but I think that uh, that's a natural reaction of a pilot uh, to uh, have a little bit of extra protection uh, stashed away in the hip pocket. Uh, we feel uh, that there is much confidence in the, uh, in the uh, delta V or the uh, fuel margins that are available. And certainly uh, throughout descent, we uh, uh, will be very closely monitoring these as will uh, the emission control. And uh, we feel that uh, it is quite uh, a natural thing and, and should be quite easy for uh, both the mission control and for us on board to be able to identify any uh, potential shortcomings in the uh, LEM systems. And uh, there'll be many, many people looking at uh, each and every bit of telemetry that comes back to the Earth. And uh, there will be thousands of people on call to uh, give advice, should any be needed. Uh, I, I feel very confident in this uh, vehicle. I think it's done a very good job in the uh, two previous flights. And I certainly feel that it's, it's ready to perform this mission, which it was uh, initially designed for. Mr. Cronkite? Having come this far down the road toward putting men on the moon, you men in, in particular, uh, do you see any, any other approach to accomplishing this than the one we've taken? Looking back eight years and knowing what we know now, might we have done this better, more efficiently than we've done it? Well, as, as you know, Walter, uh, all the three major approaches to the lunar landing strategy, that is the one that used the rocket to go directly to the moon and the same vehicle to fly back, second strategy that used uh, assembly of vehicles from various launches in Earth orbit and then thence uh, an expedition to the moon and return, and the final uh, method, the one that was chosen, uh, the lunar orbit rendezvous, wherein uh, a vehicle, the vehicle combination is sent to the moon and then one section detached and sent down to the lunar surface are all capable of, uh, of doing the job. I think uh, those of us uh, that have participated in the development of the Apollo uh, spacecraft and the rendezvous techniques necessary to, uh, to make that a realistic way of going between uh, the moon and and the earth believe that it's uh, the best way 
uh, certainly was the one that was uh, promised to be the least expensive and the, the one that would use the, less, the least time. And uh, uh, we're very comfortable with uh, this one of, of several approaches that, that would have worked. Mr. Rossiter? Well, Mr. Armstrong, on Apollo 9, we had a red rover call sign during his spacewalk. Uh, how do you and Colonel Aldrin plan to refer to your, yourselves uh, doing your EVA? Uh, we just expect to use our names. Mr. Clark? Uh, this is for Neil Armstrong. Um, you, can't pro you can't make a landing on the moon without going there, as we keep being reminded. And yet you have to practice it as nearly as possible. And you do this with simulators of various kinds. I guess you even uh, flew a helicopter the other day, maybe as a, as a warm-up. How do you feel about the fidelity of these simulators? In other words, how, how close do you feel you have come now to having really practiced what you, you're going to face next Sunday? Well, our, our simulators are, are amazing devices. They uh, give unbelievably uh, good fidelity uh, in terms of the cockpit, the scenes you see out the window, and the responses to your maneuvers and engine thrusting and so on. Uh, we've also been very fortunate and they've given us very good reliability in past months and it has been the thing that has made the preparation of the crew possible uh, for launching this summer. Uh, simulators can always be better, however, and uh, I'm quite certain that when we actually uh, get into the flight environment we'll find uh, a lot of things that are they're different than uh, they were in the simulator. Has your crew had as much uh, simulator time now as the uh, nine crew and the ten crew did? I uh, I don't have the numbers available to me, but I suspect they're very comparable. Mr. Shurkin, this is for anyone who cares to answer. The Russians seem to feel that machines can do almost everything a man can. Why are you going? Why are we sending men and not machines? Well, I think we believe that uh, men can do many of the things that, that machines can do, that uh, an adequate or a, uh, a, uh, a reasonable uh, mixing of the two to accomplish missions in space is, uh, is required, and we must uh, learn where each type of a mission has its place. Certainly in the exploration of the moon, both types can be used quite well as uh, We've evidence from the surveyor program that's uh, given us amazing results. Uh, we feel that there are many things that uh, uh, rely on judgment on the spot, and uh, we feel that uh, this is where the uh, manned flights uh, will, will really come to their own in, in the future. Mr. Cronkite? Uh, gentlemen, I understand that everybody uh, out there at Merritt Island and here, well, is a little tired of, uh, of this problem that came up in the last couple of days, but it's a matter of the president not uh, or being disinvited to come down after he was invited by you to be present. And uh, at a news conference this afternoon, uh, Dr. Charles Berry had a, one more word on the matter. He said that uh, uh, he repeated what he said before about the need for the uh, medical security for you gentlemen and that applied to the president as well, but he also said he did not know whether it would be beneficial for the president to have seen the crew before liftoff psychologically. Uh, I wonder, if you, uh, some of your colleagues have felt that it would have been beneficial. Neil? Well, I, I uh, certainly uh, uh, wouldn't attempt to uh, make judgments in preventive medicine or uh, fields of those kinds with which I'm not an expert, it would have been a great pleasure for us to, uh, to see the president, uh, and it was very kind of him to uh, offer to, jo to join us uh, for, uh, for dinner. I look forward to, to uh, seeing him sometime after the flight. This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control, T-minus one hour, 11 minutes, 55 seconds and counting. The countdown for Apollo 11 still going very satisfactorily at this time. 
In most cases, we're a matter of uh, five or ten minutes ahead of the countdown procedures. The crew in the white room at the 320-foot level who have been aiding the astronauts up to this time are just in the process of finishing up their work. They've been advised by the spacecraft test conductor that they'll probably be able to move out in about three minutes or so. Once this is accomplished, once the closeout crew does depart, we'll be ready to uh, move that swing arm back, swing arm nine. It will be moved 12 degrees away from the spacecraft hatch. This is about five feet away from the hatch. Once this is accomplished, we will arm the pyrotechnic systems in the spacecraft. So the in, in the event of a possible, possible catastrophic condition below them with the launch vehicle, while still on the pad, the astronauts could fire that escape rocket and separate uh, from uh, the rocket in difficulty. The crew, uh, closeout crew about to depart at this time. That swing arm remains about 12 degrees away from the spacecraft hatch, as mentioned, five feet or so, until the five minute mark in the count when it's fully retracted to its fallback position. The obvious reason here is in the event we do have to get the astronauts out in a hurry, the swing arm is in a standby position and can be moved rapidly back to the hatch, uh, to the hatch level so the astronauts could depart uh, in the event of an, uh, an emergency. We're coming up on T minus one hour, 10 minutes and 20 seconds. This is Kennedy Launch Control. Mr. Rossiter? Colonel Collins, uh, you will be flying the command module alone for some 28 hours, I believe, around the moon. Uh, do you expect any difficulties in flying solo for that length of time? I believe it's the longest time the command module has been flown solo. No, I really don't, Mr. Roster. Uh, of course, Dave Scott before me and also John Young have uh, done precisely the things which I must do. It's going to take me a little bit longer to do them, but I don't think that uh, is especially germane. I do have one complaint, however, I'd like to, to point out to uh, those of you, particularly in the television business, that uh, I have uh, no TV set on board, and therefore I'm going to be one of the few Americans who's not going to be able to see the, the EVA, so I, I'd like you to save the tapes for me, please. I'd like to look at them after the flight. <laughs> Mr. Clark? Uh, this is for Colonel Aldrin, uh, but it really is for all three of you if you care to answer it. I wonder if you're as tense for your own flight as you are when you're waiting for other astronauts to go up. Uh, for example, Apollos 7, 8, 9, and 10. Do you feel any more uh, excited or, or uh, uptight for your own flight than you do for other people's? Well, there's, there's no doubt that uh, when, when you're lying on your back on top of the, the mighty Saturn V, that uh, there's a different feeling than, than when you look up and, and see one of your compatriots uh, doing the same thing. Uh, I, I think I would uh, maybe sum up my feelings in, in a word of uh, anticipation. This is what, to me, uh, characterizes uh, my feelings right now as I look forward to the next uh, few days. Mr. Shurkin? This is for anyone who cares to answer. Do you think NASA made a mistake in the early days when they planned Apollo for not planning for a rescue, the capability of rescuing you in case you have to come into trouble? I, I, I certainly don't. I think that uh, a rescue mission at this time is uh, uh, beyond uh, our state of ability, certainly beyond our financial ability to uh, to fund, and I think the approach that was taken, namely building the, spa the safety into the spacecraft, is the proper one for this uh, stage of spacecraft development. This is Apollo Launch Control at one hour, seven minutes, 25 seconds and counting. Countdown still proceeding satisfactorily. For those uh, people who would like to synchronize their watches in relation to the count will synchronize on 26 minutes past the hour, which is now about uh, 65 seconds away. We'll count down the last five seconds to 26 minutes past the hour. We're now one minute away from 26 minutes past the hour. In the meantime, we do have uh, information from the civil defense uh, agencies in the area 
The estimate is more than a million persons are in the immediate area in Brevard County uh, to watch the launch. Now 40 seconds away from 26 minutes past the hour. Civil Defense Agency reports further that uh, there is extensive heavy traffic, a number of traffic jams, particularly in the area of Titusville, uh, near US-1 and Route 50. Countdown still progressing satisfactorily, 15 seconds away from 26 minutes. Five, four, three, two, one, mark. 8.26 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. We're now one hour, five minutes, 55 seconds and counting as uh, it was announced at that point. This is Kennedy Launch Control. Mr. Cronkite? Uh, Neil, uh, we heard earlier after the flight of Apollo 10 that unless uh, you found the answer to the wild gyrations uh, and the firing of the ascent stage, uh, uh, the LEM during that flight, uh, that uh, you wouldn't go. And yet, uh, we haven't heard that you've solved the wild gyration problem. Uh, what, are you, what are you doing about that? I, I think we understand uh, the nature of the, of the uh, difficulty that came up with the Apollo 10, even though we, we don't, we cannot pre precisely ascribe the difficulty to a certain uh, failure. And uh, our procedure is one uh, where we have procedurally uh, uh, implemented methods uh, of circumventing the problem. And should it occur, we have uh, procedures that will uh, uh, be able to, uh, to cancel the kind of uh, problem we might get in. Mr. Rossiter? Mr. Armstrong, you and uh, Colonel Aldrin are going to be on the moon for almost a day. Do you expect to be able to sleep during your rest periods in the lunar module? Well, I don't know about those. I suspect I'll be uh, uh, surprised if I'm able to get sound sleep on the lunar surface. But uh, fortunately, our flight plan doesn't, uh, doesn't require that. Uh, we have uh, adequate rest on both the night before and the night after the one in question. And uh, I think even if uh, my worst suspicions are true, we'll be in fine shape. We have time for one final question. Mr. Clark, you have what amounts to a day off tomorrow. What, is a, what do three men who are about to go to the moon and uh, make a landing do with a day off? They crack that, Mike. Well, I plan to sleep, lie in the sun, and uh, read the flight plan again. <laughs> that completes the conference. Thank you very much, gentlemen, and good luck from everybody here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very Thank much. you. Before we get to the astronaut biographies, since it was referenced in the interview, let's talk about what happened in the previous mission, Apollo 10. That mission launched two months before this one and carried Tom Stafford, John Young, and Gene Cernan. Their goal was to do everything Apollo 11 would do, except actually land on the moon and pick up samples. It must have been rough getting that tantalizingly close without actually landing, but they did their job, dumping the descent module when they would have started to make the landing, and using the ascent module to bring them back up to the command module's orbit in its abort mode. As the reporter noted, things did not go perfectly. When separating the descent stage, the module jerked to one side and wasn't lined up with where the ascent engine was supposed to be firing. Cernan and Stafford had a brief moment of concern, but got the situation under control. The ascent module has limited ability to maneuver though, and that role had been close to being unrecoverable. The problem was due to the crew giving the flight computer duplicate commands, and it wasn't in the mode it was supposed to be in. It's possible that Armstrong was already informed about what had gone wrong with Apollo 10 at this point, and just didn't want to embarrass the astronauts. 
The fault was also likely due to the strange way they were initiating the maneuver, simulating an abort to orbit from the surface without being in that situation. Later on, both John Young and Gene Cernan would get to land on the moon, commanding Apollo 16 and 17 respectively, so they didn't miss out on their chance, and both got much longer three-day stays on the moon along with a lunar rover to drive, which Apollo 11 didn't have. Stafford presumably had the option to command a lunar landing mission, but his next mission was the joint mission with the Soviet Union, the Apollo-Soyuz test project. This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control, T-minus 61 minutes and counting, T-minus 61 minutes on the Apollo 11 countdown and all elements are go at this time. Astronaut Neil Armstrong has just completed a series of checks on that big service propulsion system engine that sits below him in the stack. We want to assure ourselves before liftoff that that engine can respond to commands from inside the spacecraft. As Neil Armstrong moved his rotational hand controller, we assured ourselves that the engine did respond by swiveling or gimbling. This, is, of course, is uh, important for maneuvers uh, in space. The countdown is still proceeding very satisfactorily, other than two minor problems. Uh, since we picked up the count at 11 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time last night, all has gone well. As we approach the one-hour mark now in the count, a series of radio frequency and telemetry checks will be in progress uh, with the launch vehicle. We'll also check out the tracking beacons in the uh, instrument unit uh, that travels uh, as a guidance system for the Saturn V during the powered phase of flight. Now 59 minutes, 48 seconds, and counting, this is Kennedy Launch Control. Neil Alden Armstrong, the commander of Apollo 11, was born in Wapakoneta, Ohio on August 5, 1930. He was just short of his 39th birthday when he launched on Apollo 11 and would actually spend his birthday in quarantine on returning. He had been enthusiastic about aerospace engineering from childhood and went to Purdue University to study aeronautical engineering. He paid for his education through the Holloway Plan, which was two years of study, three years in the Navy as an officer, and then back to finish a bachelor's degree. During his three year stint in the Navy, Armstrong became a naval aviator and after training, joined Fighter Squadron VF-51, which in the Korean War was the first to take jets into combat. He flew a Grumman F-9F Panther in 78 missions over Korea in early 1952. On one mission, he was either hit by anti-aircraft fire, had an accident involving a pole and a cable, or both. That resulted in him flying the plane back but forced to eject because he had lost an aileron. This began a long history of Armstrong surviving close calls while piloting machines. He ultimately graduated from Purdue with his bachelor's in aeronautical engineering in 1955. Just after his moon mission, he completed his master's from the University of Southern California. Shortly after graduation from Purdue, he got married to fellow Purdue student Janet Elizabeth Sheeran, and they moved to Southern California. Neil had become a test pilot for NACA, the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, which was the precursor to NASA. By March of 1956, Armstrong was in the co-pilot seat in a B-29 alongside Stan Bouchard, and they were about to release a Douglas Skyrocket, which would eventually become the first plane to pass Mach 2, fly past twice the speed of sound. Suddenly, the number 4 engine on the B-29 was having trouble, and they had to quickly figure out a way to drop the Skyrocket because the B-29 couldn't land with the other plane still attached. The number 4 propeller ripped apart just as they dropped the Skyrocket and damaged the engine next to it. They had to shut down the number 1 engine on the other side of the plane to keep it from yawing out of control, landing with just one engine left. Armstrong proceeded to test the F-100, F-101, F-104, F-105, and F-106, along with flying a total of more than 200 types of aircraft. Ultimately, he flew the North American X-15 for seven flights between 1960 and 1962, by which time NACA had become NASA. While he was basically at the pinnacle of aircraft test piloting during this period, Armstrong's family faced tragedy. He and Janet had three children, Eric, Karen, and Mark, but Karen died at the age of two on January 28, 1962, after having been diagnosed with a tumor 
on her brainstem six months prior. The movie First Man cast this event poignantly, but how it really affected Neil is uncertain. Undoubtedly, the death of his daughter affected him, but by the time of the Apollo 11 mission seven years later, he did seem a happier and less broody person than depicted in the movie. To be sure, whatever his personal struggles, Neil always had enthusiasm for his work, as working on the front lines of aerospace engineering had been his dream from the start. Both the test pilot and astronaut life were tough on the wives of aviators, as they were constantly in fear that their husbands would die, and their husbands were rarely present to help raise the children. Despite the struggles, Neil and Janet remained married for 38 years, separating after 34 years in 1990, and finalizing a divorce in 1994. This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control. We've just passed the 56-minute mark in our countdown. We're still proceeding in an excellent manner at this time. All elements reporting in that all systems continuing to look good at this point. We're still aiming toward our planned liftoff at the start of the lunar window, 9.32 a.m. Eastern Daylight. A short while ago, in fact, uh, the space conduct, uh, spacecraft test conductor skipped that we were doing quite well, in fact, some 15 minutes ahead on some aspects of the preparation spacecraft-wise. Armstrong replied that was fine, just as long as we don't launch 15 minutes early, obviously referring to the start of the window. The countdown is still going well, T-minus 55 minutes, 10 seconds and counting. This is Kennedy Launch Control. On April 20th, 1962, Neil Armstrong was testing the X-15's new MH-96 Adaptive Flight Control System, and in the course of putting it through its paces, kept his altitude too high for too long. You see, the X-15 had a limited amount of fuel for its main rocket. It had separate maneuvering fuel, which the MH-96 could use to keep the nose up in the upper reaches of the atmosphere, but otherwise it just glided down to a landing. By keeping the nose up for too long, Armstrong had overshot his landing area. He ended up bringing the aircraft around and landing safely, in the process accidentally setting the record for flight time and distance in the X-15. On a different flight, he set a personal top speed of Mach 5.74. Armstrong was always an engineer at heart rather than a fighter jock, and those who worked with him praised his sharp engineering acumen, while some of the pure pilots were skeptical of his flying skills. Only four days after his record flight in the X-15, he was in a T-33 with Chuck Yeager, flying to evaluate landing conditions on a lake bed. He ended up getting the plane stuck in mud, much to Yeager's amusement. Less than a month later, he was flying an F-104, and his landing gear was not properly extended when he tried to set down. He quickly reacted by going full throttle and gaining altitude again, but damage to the plane would require an emergency landing at Nellis Air Force Base. His plane landed at Nellis in bad shape, and he called for another NASA pilot to pick him up. What happened next is recounted in the book First Man, but it's sufficient to say that when pilots looked askance at engineers trying to fly, they had incidents to point to. That said, even Chuck Yeager crashed, though when he did so, the movie The Right Stuff decided to portray it in a more positive, heroic light. As his time with the X-15 wound down, Armstrong found himself on the X-20 test pilot list, assuming that plane ever got off the ground, which it wouldn't. But at the same time, NASA was looking for more astronauts for Project Gemini, and had decided to allow civilian test pilots rather than just military ones. Neil wasn't totally sure which way to go, and turned in his application a week late, but ultimately got the call from Director of Flight Crew Operations Deke Slayton anyway. Slayton was in charge of determining who flew on what mission, and would ultimately be the decider in terms of putting Armstrong, Aldrin, and Collins on Apollo 11, and having Neil be the first to set foot on the moon. Armstrong's first space flight, Gemini 8, launched on March 16, 1966. He and David Scott performed the first ever docking between two spacecraft, a necessary precursor to the Apollo missions, which required a rendezvous and docking between the command module and the lunar module around the moon. They docked their Gemini spacecraft to an uncrewed Agena target vehicle that had been launched separately. The success was only one of many mission goals, including a scheduled spacewalk by David Scott. They had no real chance to celebrate, however. Soon after the docking, and during an expected period where they were out of communication with mission control due to lack of a tracking station, Scott and Armstrong suddenly realized that the combination of the two spacecraft had started spinning, and the rate of spin was increasing. 
To eliminate the possibility that the Gina was at fault, they quickly undocked, but the rotation only got worse, so the problem was with their Gemini. As they were rapidly getting to the point where they would lose consciousness, Armstrong decided to shut down the orbital maneuvering thrusters and activate the thruster system that was only supposed to be used for re-entry. The re-entry thrusters were able to stop the spin, the problem had been the malfunctioning thruster on the orbital maneuvering system, but according to mission rules, activating the re-entry system required an immediate end to the mission, so David Scott would not do his EVA and all the other goals were out the window. On the one hand, Armstrong's quick thinking had saved their lives, however the mission was only a partial success and there are plenty of people who in hindsight thought that Armstrong could have done this or that differently. The end assessment was that the crew had done the best they could, Armstrong remained on the normal rotation, which placed him as backup for Gemini 11. This is Apollo Saturn launch control. We've passed the 51 minute mark in our countdown. We're now T minus 50 minutes, 51 seconds and counting. Apollo 11 countdown is still go at this time. All elements reporting ready at this point in the countdown. The spacecraft uh, correction the test supervisor, Bill Schick, has advised all hands here in the control center and uh, the spacecraft checkout people. Then in about 30 seconds, that big swing arm that has been attached to the spacecraft up to now will be moved back to a park position some five feet away from the spacecraft. We alert the astronauts because there is a little jolt when the swing arm is moved away. It will remain in that position some five feet away from the spacecraft until the five minute mark and the count when it's completely pulled back to its retracted position. It's coming up now in five seconds, the swing arm will come back. Mark, the swing arm now coming back from the spacecraft. Countdown proceeding satisfactorily. We've completed our telemetry checks with the launch vehicle. And at this point with the swing arm back, we arm the pyrotechnics so that escape tower atop the astronauts, atop their spacecraft, could be used if a ca catastrophic condition was going to occur under them with the launch vehicle from this point on down in the countdown. We have the high-speed elevator located at the 320-foot level in the event the astronauts have to get out in a hurry. This is a special precaution. Uh, but one of the members of the support team for Apollo 11, astronaut Bill Pogue, is here in the firing room. He acts as the capsule communicator during the countdown. His call sign is Stoney. He controls that elevator. He now has it locked at the 320-foot level. These are special precautions for safety purposes during the final phase of the count. Now coming up on the 49-minute mark in the countdown, this is Kennedy Launch Control. After the conclusion of the Gemini program and the start of the Apollo program, Armstrong was made a backup commander again, this time backing Apollo 8, which was the first crewed flight to orbit the moon. That backup assignment suggested Armstrong would command Apollo 11 by Deke Slayton's normal pattern, where a backup crew would become the prime crew three flights later. And Slayton made that official while Apollo 8 was in orbit around the moon. Being commander on Apollo 11 did not necessarily mean Armstrong would be the first to set foot on the moon, and there were some indications in early documentation that the lunar module pilot, in this case Buzz Aldrin, would be the first. However, Slayton's own impulse was to say that the commander should be first. There was also a consideration of how the hatch swung inward, which made it awkward for the lunar module pilot to get out first, but there was also the fact that Neil was such a low-key, easy-to-get-along-with guy, and back then, Buzz was perceived as less of a team player and rubbed people the wrong way. Buzz himself has noted that he wasn't good at office politics, instead enjoying competition and feeling that astronauts should be rated by some objective criteria and given assignments like that. So Neil Armstrong would become the first to set foot on the moon if everything went alright on Apollo 9 and Apollo 10, and then everything went right up to the moon landing on his own mission. And it mostly did. Well, well enough anyway, though that was hardly a guarantee when he got the assignment. The near disaster that occurred on Apollo 13 could have happened on one of the earlier missions, for instance. While training for landing on the moon, Armstrong faced another one of those incidents where a machine tried to kill him. This time it was the Lunar Landing Research Vehicle, or LLRV. Nicknamed the Flying Bedsteads, they were meant to simulate the last phase of the lunar landing by using a large turbofan engine that lifted them up and then compensated for five-sixths of the craft's weight, all but the weight that it would have on the moon. The LLRV and its successor, the LLTV, looked dangerous, and they were. Three of them were wrecked in crashes, and one of those tried to bring Neil down with it, but he ejected in time. 
Fortunately, they were fitted with special ejection seats that can function even when the vehicle is on the ground stationary. Most ejection seats need some altitude for safe ejection so the parachute can deploy. As precarious as the LLRV and LLTV were, they were also considered the best training methods for landing on the moon, as Armstrong attested to despite his mishap. It was designed specifically to match the feel of the lunar lander closely, and the alternative was a helicopter, which wasn't much like the lunar module. After Apollo 11, Armstrong had a reputation for shying away from public spotlight, but it wasn't entirely true. He gave interviews, occasionally acted as a spokesperson for companies whose engineering he admired, like Chrysler. He was involved in the Apollo 13 accident investigation and a Challenger disaster investigation. He hosted documentaries. What might be more accurate to say is that he didn't exploit his historic role the way we might expect an average person to do. Neil Armstrong passed away on August 25th, 2012 at the age of 82. This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control. We've passed the 46 minute mark in our countdown. T minus 45 minutes, 52 seconds and counting. All elements still go in the countdown at this time. The hard worker in the spacecraft at this point in the countdown, astronaut Buzz Aldrin in the middle seat. He's been uh, working with the spacecraft test conductor on setting up proper switch settings in preparation for pressurizing their reaction control system. These are these uh, big thrusters on the side of the service module. There's actually 16 of them in four quadrants around the service module. They are used for maneuvers in space. We pressurize that system before liftoff. Uh, that uh, particular operation will be coming up in some five minutes or so. In preparation for it, Buzz Aldrin, who has most of the switches uh, in front of him, has been uh, preparing for that particular event. The launch vehicle people keeping an eye on the status of the various propellants aboard the Saturn V launch vehicle. Just at liftoff, uh, we will have a vehicle weighing close to six and a half million pounds on the launch pad. There's more than a million gallons of uh, propellants aboard the three stages of Saturn V. The reports here in the control center are the propellants are stable. We did take a look a little while ago at the RP-1, the high-grade high kerosene fuel that's used in the first stage of the Saturn V to make sure it was at its proper level. We keep an eye on these various aspects uh, throughout the count and use the aid of computers uh, to keep an overall look on general status. We're now at T-minus 44 minutes, 21 seconds and counting. This is Kennedy Launch Control. Michael Collins, the command module pilot for Apollo 11, was born on October 31st, 1930 in Rome, Italy, because his father was a military attaché stationed there. Collins lived all over the United States in his youth, Oklahoma, New York, Maryland, Ohio, Puerto Rico, Texas, and Virginia. He was from a military family, and with a father and older brother who had both graduated from West Point, he had no trouble getting an appointment to the military academy either. Collins may be the least known member of the Apollo 11 crew because he didn't set foot on the moon, but we have benefited from his ability to give expression to the experience in writing. He wrote a remarkably eloquent autobiography only a few years after the mission called Carrying the Fire, and the close proximity of the writing to the events it describes is evident in the details Collins shares in the book. He begins with his early life and how he decided to join the Air Force partly because he didn't want to be accused of nepotism and didn't want to live in his family's shadow, but also because developments in aircraft were proceeding at such a fast pace that he wanted to be part of that. He proved to be a solid pilot and took part in advanced F-86 training at Nellis Air Force Base in 1953. Collins notes in his book that the training was so dangerous that 11 people were killed in 22 weeks. He was mainly involved in training for the next few years. In 1956, he had to eject from an F-86. Ejecting is not without its dangers, and Collins injured his back during the ejection in a way that would only become manifest a decade later. For the most part, as he would probably concede, Collins had a much more boring time in the 1950s than Armstrong did. He was trying to accumulate enough flying time to enter the U.S. Air Force Experimental Flight Test Pilot School at Edwards Air Force Base, but that had been slow going thanks to his postings. Finally, on August 29, 1960, he got in. He flew the F-86, B-57, and F-104, among other planes. By 1962, though, after seeing John Glenn's flight, he decided that he wanted to become an astronaut. He applied during the same application period that Armstrong was selected in, Group 2, but he didn't get in. Two of his classmates at the test pilot school did, though, Tom Stafford and Frank Borman. Collins had not expected to get in, 
but it was impossible not to be disappointed. Meanwhile, the Air Force had aspirations of creating its own astronaut class, aside from NASA's, and Collins got in on that. They flew F-104s as high as they could go, enough so that they experienced some weightlessness at the top of the arc. It was something, but Collins still wanted to become a NASA astronaut and applied again. This time, he was accepted and became part of the third group of astronauts, along with Buzz Aldrin. In Carrying the Fire, Collins, in one short section, assesses the characters of each of the astronauts he was familiar with, spending only one or two sentences on each. It was a gutsy move considering how sharp some of his comments were, and considering this book was written in 1974, when some of those described were still in NASA. I'll present his assessments of himself and his two crewmates after a PAO update that's coming up right now. This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control. We passed the 41 minute mark in our count. T minus 40 minutes, 53 seconds and counting. We are continuing and we are continuing very excellently at this time. There are no problems that have been reported in as the countdown uh, continues to click down. We're still aiming for the start of our window on this, the first flight to land men on the moon. Our, we're aiming toward our planned liftoff time of 9.32 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Coming up shortly will be a key test here in the firing room as far as the launch vehicle people are concerned. It's a, some final checks of the destruct system aboard the three stages of the Saturn V launch vehicle. In the event uh, during powered flight that the vehicle strayed rather violently off course, uh, the range safety officer could take action to destroy the vehicle. This obviously would occur after the astronauts were separated by their escape tower from the faulty vehicle. We make a check of the destruct system to assure that if a signal is required to get through, that in fact it will. This is what is coming up here in the control center at this time. All aspects of the mission still go. We're at T-minus 39 minutes, 47 seconds and counting. This is Kennedy Launch Control. Of himself, Michael Collins wrote, and I quote, Okay, if you're looking for a handball game, but otherwise nothing special. Lazy, in this group of overachievers at least, frequently ineffectual, detached, waits for happenings instead of causing them. Balances this with generally good judgment and a broader point of view than most. Of Neil Armstrong, he wrote, Makes decisions slowly and well. As Borman gulps decisions, Armstrong savors them rolling them around on his tongue like a fine wine and swallowing at the very last moment. And in parentheses, he had 20 seconds of fuel remaining when he landed on the moon. And parentheses. Neil is a classy guy, and I can't offhand think of a better choice to be first man on the moon. Of Buzz Aldrin, he said, heavy man, heavy, would make a champion chess player, always thinks several moves ahead. If you don't understand what Buzz is talking about today, you will tomorrow or the next day. Fame has not worn well on Buzz. I think he resents not being first on the moon more than he appreciates being second. We've also talked a bit about Deke Slayton, their boss, and of him Collins says, The super straight shooter, honest, no nonsense, grounded by the medics in an absurd auto de fe involving irregular heartbeats. Should have flown to the moon and back many times over by now, but has not gotten past his Houston desk, where he presides over all the astronauts and a lot of engineers, and the program is better for it. The best boss I ever had, with the possible exception of William P. Rogers. Incidentally, Slayton would finally be cleared for space flight by the medics in 1972, and he flew on the Apollo Soyuz test project in 1975. Gemini 10 was the first space flight for Michael Collins, and he was paired with John Young, who had flown on Gemini 3 and would later fly on two Apollo missions and two space shuttle missions. Of John Young, Collins wrote, Mysterious. The epitome of the non-hero, with a country boy's aw shucks taint nothing demeanor, which masks a delightful wit and a keen engineer's mind. Collins and Young spent nearly three days in orbit together for the mission. They docked to an Agena, no spinning this time, and then used the fuel from that Agena to rendezvous with the Agena that Armstrong had left behind in Gemini 8. Collins had to conduct two spacewalks, EVAs, but had a lot of difficulty during them and tired easily. That was because NASA hadn't figured out how to train for and conduct spacewalks properly yet. Collins did not have any handholds or foot restraints to help him achieve his objectives during the EVAs, and the training had been inadequate. Buzz Aldrin would be the first to be trained underwater for the spacewalk, and would demonstrate the correct technique for the first time in Gemini 12. 
Gemini 10 would also be the only Gemini mission to deliberately enter the inner Van Allen belt to gauge the radiation dose to the crew. John Young got 670 millirads and Collins got 765 millirads, which, while more than four times the dose for the next highest crew, were well below, by a significant margin, dire predictions prior to the mission. For reference, the normal exposure for a person is 100 to 200 millirads a year, so about a third to a quarter of what Collins got on the mission, and the annual limit for a worker in a high radiation environment, like a pilot or a reactor worker, is 5,000 millirads or 50 rads a year. At 100 rads a year or more, there is increased risk of cancer and other effects, and if that dose is reached suddenly, there is a possibility of radiation sickness. It depends a lot on exactly how the exposure takes place, what part of the body is exposed, and for what period of time. This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control. We passed the 36 minute mark in our countdown. T minus 35 minutes, 48 seconds, and counting. We've completed those range safety command checks, all still going well with the countdown. A short while ago, spacecraft test conductor Skip Chauvin asked uh, Neil Armstrong if the crew was comfortable up there. And uh, Neil reported back, he said, it's, we're very comfortable, it's very nice this morning. For a status report, we'll now switch to Mission Control, Houston. This is Apollo Mission Control. Flight Director Cliff Charlesworth's team is on station here in the Mission Operations Control Room, ready to assume the control of this flight at tower clearance. There is a possibility that Apollo 11 will check out the command module color TV camera during the first Earth revolution while in contact with the Goldstone Station. If this checkout does occur, we, we acquire Goldstone at 1 hour 29 minutes elapsed time. We have loss of signal at 1 hour 33 minutes 50 seconds elapsed time. This TV camera checkout is a possibility. This is Mission Control Houston. After Gemini 10, Collins was assigned to the prime crew of Apollo 8 as command module pilot, the position he would eventually have on Apollo 11. However, this is where his ejection from the F-86 started to have its effect. He began losing feeling in his legs in 1968 and had started stumbling. After getting checked out, he found that he had a cervical disc herniation and he lost the Apollo 8 spot. To get back to flight status, he would have to have two vertebrae fused together. He had the surgery, spent a few months recuperating, and became the command module pilot for Apollo 11. Technically, after Apollo 11, if Slayton kept his usual pattern, Collins would have been a backup for Apollo 14 and then commander of Apollo 17, which would have had him landing on the moon. However, he decided not to pursue that because it was far from a sure thing and there were also other circumstances like Apollo 13 and Alan Shepard getting back his flight status for Apollo 14, so it wasn't a guarantee. As it was, Collins quickly found a major way to continue contributing to aerospace history. He became director of the National Air and Space Museum in 1971, only two years after the mission. The fact was, there really wasn't an Air and Space Museum at that point. Congress had given authorization to the Smithsonian to make one after World War II, but no money, and the items were scattered all over the place. NASA had started to give the Smithsonian items like mercury capsules and eventually moon rocks, and there was plenty of public interest, but no single building to keep all the huge exhibits. Collins got some money, though not as much as he had been looking for, and supervised construction of the museum, which opened on July 1st, 1976, just in time for the bicentennial. Mike Collins seems to be enjoying the 50th anniversary of the mission, still with his characteristic wit at the age of 88. Edwin Eugene Aldrin was born on January 20th, 1930, in Glenridge, New Jersey. He got his nickname Buzz because his sister Faye, one and a half years older than him, mispronounced brother as Buzzer, and that got shortened to Buzz. His father had known Orville Wright, one of the Wright brothers who had made the first heavier-than-air flight, and had introduced Charles Lindbergh, the first to fly solo across the Atlantic, to Robert Goddard, who was the father of American rocketry. So it wasn't all too surprising that Buzz developed a desire to fly early on. 
We've already mentioned that Aldrin was competitive, and that showed at every stage in his life. He played football in high school as starting center, and his team were undefeated state champions in 1946. In 1947, he entered West Point, finished first in his class in his first year, third in his senior class, and was part of the track and field team. After graduating, he joined the Air Force, which was already embroiled in the Korean War. He flew 66 combat missions in the war, flying the F-86, and shot down two MiG-15s. Racking up accomplishments as he did, Buzz wasn't wrong to think that he earned his way through. After the war, he was stationed in Germany for a few years and flew F-100s carrying tactical nuclear weapons. One of his squadron mates was future fellow astronaut Ed White, and when White decided to pursue a master's degree in aeronautical engineering, Aldrin decided to do the same and attended MIT starting in 1959. This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control. We've just passed the 31 minute mark in our count. The T minus 30 minutes, 52 seconds and counting, aiming toward our planned liftoff time of 32 minutes past the hour. The start of our launch window on this the mission to land men on the moon. The countdown still proceeding very satisfactorily at this time. We just got by an important test with the launch vehicle, checking out the various batteries in the three stages and instrument unit of the Saturn V. We remain on external power through most of the count to preserve those batteries which must be used during the powered flight. We've just taken a look at them by going internal and then switching back to external again. The batteries all look good. The next time we go internal will be at the 52nd mark with those batteries, and they will remain, of course, on internal power during the flight. The lunar module, which has been rather inactive during these latter phases of the count, also is going on internal power at this time on the two batteries in the ascent stage and the four batteries of the descent stage. For the next 20 minutes, we'll take a look at some systems in the lunar module, then power down at about the 10-minute mark in the, in the count power down uh, the telemetry to uh, preserve the uh, power of the LEM. The lunar module in Apollo 11, of course, when it separates from the command module in lunar orbit, will have the call sign Eagle. The command module call sign, once the two vehicles separate, will be Columbia. Both Columbia and Eagle are go at this time at 29 minutes, 24 seconds and counting. This is Kennedy Launch Control. By 1963, Buzz Aldrin had earned a doctorate in astronautics. His thesis was on rendezvous techniques, precisely the type of techniques NASA needed to develop if they wished to go to the moon. The Gemini program was just starting up at this point, and Buzz hoped that his thesis topic would catch people's eye and get him in as an astronaut despite the fact that he had not been a test pilot at any point, unlike Armstrong or Collins or practically all of the other astronauts at the time. He initially got involved in Project Gemini as an advisor, helping with the maneuvering system on the Agena target vehicle. He had applied to Astronaut Group 2 even though there was a test pilot requirement and was rejected as Collins had been. As Collins noted later, Group 2 was a particularly impressive group of astronauts and it was hard to get in without really checking all the boxes. Consider that Armstrong, who did get in with Group 2, was already a test pilot for NASA at the time. Ed White was also part of Group 2. For Group 3, though, NASA was willing to waive the test pilot requirement as long as the applicant had 1,000 hours logged in jets, and Aldrin had double that. He got in alongside Collins and was the first astronaut with a doctorate. He got the nickname Dr. Rendezvous from fellow astronauts, but this was partly a reminder that he wasn't quite like the rest of the pack. They were all test pilots, including Deke Slayton, who made the flight assignments, and he wasn't really a part of their club, despite having combat experience and ample engineering experience. Now, perhaps the right thing to have done in this situation would have been to show that he was an alright guy after all, despite not coming in with exactly the same experience, and to keep his head down to demonstrate that he was a team player. As Aldrin later recognized, he definitely didn't attempt to do this. He had a tendency to say exactly what was on his mind. Rendezvous was a major goal of most of the Gemini missions, and he had basically written the book on the topic. He had studied it precisely because he knew how much that would help NASA's efforts in space. He felt that he was uniquely qualified for the Gemini missions and basically made that clear. That did not endear him to anyone, and he got passed over for seats on the spacecraft until the untimely deaths of Elliot C. and Charlie Bassett in a T-38 crash. 
That moved him up to the Prime crew for the very last Gemini mission, Gemini 12. When originally planned, Gemini 12 was just meant to be a cleanup mission, take care of anything that the other nine crewed Gemini missions hadn't already accomplished. By the time Buzz was assigned to the mission though, it began to take on more urgency, as Gemini 8 had been forced to come back down early because Neil had activated that re-entry system, the Gemini 9 spacewalk had almost caused Gene Cernan to lose consciousness because of overexertion, and the spacewalks on Gemini 10 and 11 fared only a bit better. So Buzz had to become an expert on extravehicular activities, or EVAs, the technical term for a spacewalk. Fortunately, unlike the earlier missions, he had an opportunity to train underwater in a special tank with a mock-up of the spacecraft. His Gemini would also have handholds and foot restraints, which the other missions lacked. This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control. We're just past the 26 minute mark in the count. T minus 25 minutes, 53 seconds and counting. Still proceeding very satisfactorily. At this time, the spacecraft test conductor Skip Chauvin working with astronaut Buzz Aldrin in the middle seat, uh, covering the final pressurization of the reaction control system for the spacecraft. These are those uh, big thrusters on the side of the service module that are used for maneuvers in space. Each one of these thrusters is capable of 100 pounds of thrust. There are 16 of them loaded, located in four quadrants around the service module. We pressurized the system with helium uh, prior to launch to make sure that all will be in readiness for use in space. The countdown still proceeding satisfactorily. It picked up uh, at the T minus nine hour mark at 11 p.m. Eastern Daylight last evening. We've just had two comparatively minor problems uh, since that time. The major portion of uh, the countdown uh, during the early morning hours, some five hours of work was taken to load the various propellants aboard the stages of the Saturn V launch vehicle. As we came into the count this morning, we did already have uh, the fuel aboard the first stage, but it was necessary to bring the liquid oxygen aboard all three stages and the liquid hydrogen fuel aboard the second and third stages. Uh, close to uh, three quarters of a million gallons of propellants were loaded during these five hours. Following uh, that, the astronauts, the prime crew, were awakened at 4.15 a.m. Eastern Daylight as planned in their countdown and proceeded to uh, have a physical examination in which they were declared flight ready. They sat down for the normal astronaut fair on launch day as far as breakfast is concerned, orange juice, steak, scrambled eggs, toast, and coffee. The three uh, pilots were joined by two of their colleagues at breakfast, uh, Director of Flight Crew Operations, Deke Slayton, and the backup command module pilot, Bill Anders, who uh, has been uh, named uh, the Executive Secretary of the National Aeronautics and Space Council. The astronauts departed from their crew quarters uh, after checking out their suits. They departed from the crew quarters at 6.27 a.m. and some 27 minutes later, eight miles away from the crew quarters at the Kennedy Space Center, atop the launch pad at Complex 39, 6.54 a.m., the commander, astronaut Neil Armstrong, was the first to board the spacecraft. He was uh, followed about five minutes later by Mike Collins, and finally Buzz Aldrin, the man who's sitting in the middle seat during liftoff, was the third astronaut to come aboard. Two minor problems have been encountered during the count. Early in the count, a malfunction light came on here in the control center, indicating that we might have a communication problem at the launch pad. Nothing to do with the spacecraft, but it indicated we possibly might not be able to talk to some uh, key technicians we had at the pad. Uh, the problem turned out to be very minor. A simple adjustment of some equipment beneath the pad uh, remedied the problem. There was no, uh, in fact, no equipment problem involved. The second problem, we did encounter a leaky valve in part of the equipment that's used to replenish the hydrogen fuel supply on the third stage of the Saturn V launch vehicle. A team of technicians were sent out to the launch pad at about the time the astronauts were traveling to the pad. They tightened some bolts and uh, we were able to bypass this valve and uh, proceed with our countdown. The weather is uh, certainly go. It's a beautiful morning for a launch to the moon. We expect a temperature of about 85 degrees in the Kennedy Space Center area. The wind's about 10 miles, 10 knots rather, from the southeast. And uh, the weather conditions and the round the world track, according to reports from the Manned Space Flight Meteorology Group, indicate all weather conditions are acceptable for launch. 
That's our general status. We've just passed the 22-minute mark in the count. 21 minutes, 55 seconds and counting. This is Kennedy Launch Control. Mastering EVAs in weightlessness was not really a necessity for the Apollo lunar program, as the only time the astronauts were expected to go outside during the mission was on the surface of the moon, where there is one-sixth the gravity of Earth, which is enough to avoid some of the problems with overexertion and anchoring. Still, being able to conduct a spacewalk in weightlessness was important for the space program going forward, and thankfully, Buzz managed it on his mission to give the Gemini program a successful conclusion. He also finally got to try out his rendezvous theories firsthand. As it so happened, the Gina target vehicle paired with Gemini 12 was a leftover, a refurbished ground test article. When Lovell and Aldrin approached it and attempted to use their radar to track it, the information from the radar seemed nonsensical. Aldrin snapped into action and figured out the rendezvous manually without the help of the radar and did it with minimal use of propellant. Moving on to the Apollo program, after Mike Collins was removed from the prime crew on Apollo 8 because of his back injury, Aldrin moved up to the backup command module pilot position next to the backup commander for the mission, Neil Armstrong. When Armstrong was given command of Apollo 11, he was also given the choice of lunar module pilot, either Jim Lovell or Buzz Aldrin. Armstrong felt that it would be wrong for Lovell, who had been to space three times compared to Armstrong's own one time, to be denied a command of his own. And besides, Armstrong felt that he had worked well enough with Aldrin on the backup crew, so Buzz got the lunar module pilot slot and a chance to set foot on the moon, Lovell got command of Apollo 13, which was denied the opportunity to land due to an explosion in the Apollo service module. Incidentally, the lunar module pilot doesn't actually pilot the lunar module, but only assists the commander, who actually guides the module to its landing on the surface. This is one of the many cases in aerospace where the co-pilot doesn't want to be called the co-pilot and so gets a different pilot title instead. Since the command module pilot actually does get to control the command module at key times, this is why the lunar module pilot is considered the lowest ranked of the three crew members even though he would get to set foot on the moon while the command module pilot would not. The command module pilot also had to have had a prior space flight because he would be operating alone in space while rookies were allowed to be lunar module pilots. Early on, the lunar module pilot was supposed to be the first to get out and set foot on the moon, which would have been quite a perk. Deke Slayton, who was in charge of crew assignments, decided that this didn't work with his concept of the requirements for each position, that the lunar module pilot was the junior member of the lot, and decided that the commander should get out first. Aldrin actively fought against this, advocating for a change back to the original plan, but lost that fight. After the mission, Buzz had a rough time of it, fighting depression and alcoholism. His mother, whose maiden name happened to be Moon, had committed suicide in May of 1968, a year before the mission, and he couldn't shake a sense of blame. As her father had also committed suicide, it also seemed likely that his depression was inherited. He retired from the Air Force in 1972. His own father died after a heart attack late in 1974, basically with the exception of the Apollo 11 mission itself, the period between 1968 and 1978 was dismal for Aldrin. But in 1978, he finally quit his drinking habit. He had lacked any sense of purpose after the mission, a strange thing for a man who had, up to that point, seemed so driven. But in the 1980s, he became increasingly involved in space advocacy and started pushing for a mission to Mars, coming up with the concept of the Aldrin Cycler a habitat that would regularly go back and forth between Earth and Mars with little use of propellant. He continues to find purpose in trying to get humans to Mars today. With that, we've reached the end of this video. The next video will begin at approximately T-17 minutes, and that video will contain the Apollo 11 launch. After that, there will be three types of video. More documentary content like this video and the first one centering around key events like the transfer burn for the moon, making orbit around the moon, and landing on the moon. But in between those events, there will be coast and sleep videos. We'll have the original audio, a simulated view of the spacecraft, and perhaps some royalty-free music to fill in gaps in the audio. During the coast videos, the astronauts will be awake and there will be more activity, while in the sleep videos, there are just hourly reports from the PAO and music in between. The type of video will be in the title.
Thank you for watching the Ray's Aerospace commemoration of the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11.